my brief is to talk about the economic value of the public realm. And um, when it comes to the economic indicators that are relevant to town and city centres, I don't think we can do better than these two old favourites, vitality and viability. And vitality refers to how busy a place is, and viability is its sort of long-term sustainability, its ability to attract investment, including investment like uh, public realm improvements. So the picture there is Reading. Well, it was Reading. It's British home stores there, as you can see, is no longer trading, so it's a little bit old, the picture. But in the picture, we can see, we can sort of say, it is a vital and viable place. It's lots of people. They're spending money, they've got shopping bags. The shop facias look like they're well maintained uh, and they're well known. So they're, they're sort of multiple retailers that we know and we know that multiple retailers make their location decisions because they want to be around other successful retailers. So it's a vital and viable place. But the main focus of that picture isn't the shops, it's the space in front of them. This is a public plaza. There's seating, people chatting, resting, uh, people walking through the space, just enjoying the sunshine. And I'm going to present uh, some research that we've done that shows this symbio symbiotic relationship between those two types of space, the commercial space and the public space, when it comes to vitality and viability. And I'll continue to use vitality and viability indicators of value throughout the presentation, not only because they're the measures that we used in our research, the ESRC High Street UK 2020 project, uh, and that's what I think I've been invited to talk about, but more importantly, because these are measures that have a resonance here. So vitality and viability are mentioned in the opening sentence of the Environment, Community and Local Government's 2012 guidelines on retail planning. And whilst vitality and viability aren't used um, in exactly that, that, uh, that phrase isn't used in the dra draft um, public realm master plan, it refers to, you know, in the first sentence, um, the competitiveness and attraction of <coughs> Dublin. So we're really sort of talking about the same thing. So let me tell you a little bit about our high street project and then go on to talk about how the public realm can be a driver for economic value. So our high street project condensed over 50 years of research on, on, on retail change, retail location change. And in it, uh, we found um, you know, absolutely hundreds and hundreds of studies that looked at the, at the relationship between different factors, interventions, if you like, and how they affected town and city centres. The project was done against the backdrop of falling UK, in, in the UK at town centre spend, so a, a reducing economic value. Uh, and we're finding that not just in the UK, but lots of other countries too. So that was a sort of backdrop we, we, um, to, the, to the research, a, a large scale um, analysis of existing empirical work, and also the practical, if you like, pressures on, on UK towns and cities because they were losing their economic, ec economic uh, power. So 10 towns and cities in the UK uh, joined, most of them smaller locations apart, apart from Bristol, joined with us in this project so it wasn't just an ac academic project that, that looked at all the research. We could actually start to look at what type of interventions and what could locations actually do to bring ar around a reversal to this economic decline. The study actually found 201 factors that influence vitality and viability. Uh, they're very complicated spaces, <laughs> city centres, and there's lots of different things that impact on their performance. The size of the boxes that you see there just re relates to the amount of studies or evidence that we found on those things. So, I mean, I've worked in town centre management, city centre management, researching that for sort of 20 years. So, you know, but saw that the car parking was there, which I'm sure will be uh, something that a lot of people in the room know is, a, is a quite a contest, contested issue. And what you're talking about today is, you know, these tensions between pedestrians and car users against residents, against businesses. So we were fairly confident at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the research phase of the study, we'd found all the different factors that can impact on the success of town and city centres. But that wasn't much use for our towns. It's hard enough being a, 
a town or a city centre manager, or chief executive of uh, the local authority. It's a complicated job. Telling people it's complicated by saying there's 201 things that you need to be thinking about doesn't really make things much easier. So the towns in the project, so that we, 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 need, we need some help to prioritise these factors so that we can, we can start to think about the ones that really have the most impact. But also what the partnerships in the project, they wanted to know what they could do about things. Okay, so something can have a big impact on vitality and viability. So in the UK at the moment, we have a big discussion about uh, retail rents uh, uh, and rates. And, and rates in particular, you know, is, is, you know, there's no doubt there's a relationship between you know, excessive rates in some locations and the performance of that location. But on their own, the businesses in those towns can't do much about it because it's government policy. So they have to work at a, a national level if they're going to influence that. And that's outside the power or the time or the um, resource base you know, of, of a lot of stakeholders. So they said, we want to know what we can do locally. So after we'd, uh, sorry, that's gone a bit strange on that screen. What we did with the 201 factors is we, in, in, uh, we used a methodology called the Delphi technique. And the Delphi technique was a method that came out of the Cold War when there was a lot of uncertainty about outcomes. A lots of different stakeholders were, had different vested interests. And we felt this was a perfect analogy, if you like, for town and city centers. So we had a number of people involved in our Delphi study uh, retail property industry, planners, town and city centre managers, retailers, uh, all different people, and we needed to find some consensus over how much each of those 201 factors influenced the performance of the town centre and how much the town centre could actually influence the performance of the factor. So, I'll have to shout, I think, a little bit, but you probably get the gist of it. This axis here, how much the factor influences the performance of the location. So if it's high up on this side, it means it's having a big influence. So something like location here is very, very on the extreme here of the right hand side. So where your town or city is uh, explains a lot about your, your, your economic success. But it's also very low down on this axis, which is how much control in the location you have over the factor. So we, we could give the sort of more academic type guidance to our towns to say, if you want to be successful, you need to move nearer to London. Uh, that's going to really help your economic success, but practically, the towns can't really do a lot about that. We found that the political climate, or who, you know, the, the, the type of political feeling towards the high street uh, didn't really have much of an in impact. Obviously, it wasn't something much the towns could do about. And up there, we had things like initiatives around childminding and, and, and those sort of uh, uh, facilities to help, uh, to help people shop and use town city centres. Yes, you could easily set something like that up, or quite easily, but we didn't find it had an impact on vitality and viability. So basically, what we were looking at is that top right-hand corner. Uh, that's where the things were that the towns could do something about. So these were all... <laughs> so shuffle those off a little bit. So this corner really was forget it. That one was live with it. That one was not worth it. And it's that one over there that was the get on with it. And these were the labels the towns chose. So, you know, we now have to get this work published in academic journals. <laughs> We're going to keep these labels, though, because uh, it says exactly uh, what the quadrant's about. So whilst I haven't really applied this work directly to the public realm, I have looked through the master plan or the other publicly available documents to say, how does this research relate to the public realm and what you're doing here? So let's just uh, blow up that get on with it quadrant a little bit more. These are the things that have the most impact on vitality and viability uh, in terms of also thinking about what you can do about these things. You can actually intervene and do something. Uh, with these factors here. So we had these 25 priorities, if we like, which are now being uh, acted upon in, in lots of our partnerships, uh, not only the ones we worked with, but wider uh, and also across the, across the world. Uh, and what I've done is I've gone through your master plan and other public documents, and I've just looked where there seems to be evidence that those things that you're doing will impact on these things here. And I've colored them green and as you can see, most of the things on that list 
have gone green. Because if you intervene in the, in the public realm, in the space between the economic actors, you, you bring about economic success as well, because it's the two things, going back to that first slide, it's the symbiotic relationship between the private commercial space and the public space that adds or makes vitality and viability. One of the problems we've had in the UK, and this was um, flagged up by the Distressed Property Task Force, is that because retail has certainly lost its dominance in some way because of uh, out-of-town retailing uh, and online retailing, what we can't do is sort of have a situation where town and city centres don't keep up with changing uh, public and social, environmental and economic sort of trends and pre pressures. So one of the findings from the Distressed Property uh, Task Force is that re retail have been very dominant in the past and tends to be dominant in decision making. And I'm not saying retailing isn't important. We know it is from, from this study, but it has to be thought about in, 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 um, in balance with some of these uh, other uh, challenges that you're looking at in your public realm strategy. So I just want to have a look at some of those things that went green and maybe group them in a way that has a little bit more sense and a, a load of points on a, scatter, on a scattergram. And I've gone back to some, again, like the vitality and viability uh, policies that we were looking at in the UK in the 1980s. We started to look at the uh, activities and attractions, things like accessibility and amenity, the main drivers of town centre success to, to give you some categories to put these things under. So the first one there, attractions, what the centre has to offer. And the, all these things here are things that the public realm uh, strategy shows that you, know, you, can, you are going to influence. So for instance, in our research, we're finding that public transport hubs are becoming major anchors in a lot of locations. So whereas perhaps before people thought it was what the, what the city was offering was the anchor, sometimes the public transport hubs are the anchor in themselves. A diversity, green space, you, you, your strategy talks a lot about this. So it's not just the economic offer of locations. Entertainment and leisure, um, and the pulling power of a, of a location, and I think the very fact that you're talking so much about identity as part of your public realm strategy, will have a lot to do about your pulling power internationally. When you look at mobile direct investment, tourism, conferences, and those types of, uh, and those types of um, in inputs into your economic system. And then finally on that one is a centre livable. So promoting uh, pedestrians, cycling, those sorts of things. Accessibility, getting in and around the location, well, you've already talked today about walking, uh, but we also can think about accessibility coming into the, into, the, uh, into the city as well. So when you're looking at the waterfront development and other you know, ax axes, or things that might be open and right to, to cycling paths, roller skating, walking, jogging, whatever it is. The amenity, the quality of the experience, and this is where, you know, traditionally the public realm uh, strategies have sort of talked about having the most impact. Uh, clean, being clean and safe, getting those basics right. Other research we've done at the university shows the relationship between when people see litter and their perceptions of crime. So one of the reasons we think the crime, uh, the British Crime Survey shows every year people think crime is getting worse is because uh, the litter problem's been getting worse recently because of the cuts to street cleaning and so on. So these basic things can be very, very important. Um, necessities, in our studies, we found that car parking, toilets, benches, these things factored into necessities. You know, they're things that you need to be there to uh, either get to the space or enjoy it. And then finally, action, making things happen. So an example here of street entertainment. I was lucky to get here last night, uh, to see that the, you know, once the shots were shutting, things were going on, which is good. You want to be able to use your public realm to extend the activity hours of the location. The public realm can also show that you, you know, you're showing that you want to have a clear city identity. Uh, and the vision and strategy of what you're trying to achieve can be communicated through that. So it has a, a, a marketing and communication role as well. The other good thing about public space is that it's adaptable. So you know you can have 
festivals, markets, things can pop up out of nowhere. And that's good because we know as consumer and uh, technology changes very quickly, it's very hard for the permanent retail offer to keep up in the same way. So when you've got public space, you can populate that with things that can just exist for a short amount of time. So going back to our research then, we've, we've now got additional data, footfall data, and we're being able to test all these factors so we can come up with a numerical model to really see how much each of those factors affects vitality and viability. And this is the model as it stands at the moment. So we think about 37% of vitality and viability is in the sort of hands of the locality, if you like. And if you think about all those um, uh, squares on that graph that went green, then I don't know. I'm hazarding a guess. I'm not prepared to put this down <laughs> on a slide yet, but maybe around 25%. And then, you know, a lot of your success economically is, is you know, quite a lot of that is outside your hands. But 25% is a pretty, uh, a, a, is a fair amount to be influ influencing. And the reason why we can start to test these things is because we've got this footfall data that's been provided to us by Springboard. So initially, we just looked at two and a half years. And this is hourly footfall counting from 62 locations. So we really do start to get a picture of how places are being used. And that's you know, vitality, if you like. And it's a very, very important indicator. And we don't need to just think about it commercially. Any space, you know, if there's nobody in it, you know, it's not normally good space. So you want to see all our space being used by people. And what we found, which we were surprised about, is when we started to look at this footfall data, we found very different signatures from different types of towns in the data. And we weren't expecting to find that. So that was a signature of a comparison shopping town. So you see footfalls pretty steady all the way through the year, and then it shoots up dramatically. Uh, just before Christmas for Christmas shopping. So these tend to be the major retail centres. And retail is still really important in these locations. And they are in competition with other retail centres. They, 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 they are attracting from such a wide catchment that that's the case. But we also found these speciality centres. And I don't know if you... I had a look to see if you... I didn't see any springboard cameras uh, counting people here in Dublin, so I don't have that data, but I'm happy to look at it. If you have footfall data, I'd hazard a guess you look more like this. So because you've got the tourist offer, you've got, you know, after Easter, you've got a gradual increase of numbers through the city, but you've still got a strong retail offer, and that shows in that peak before Christmas. So that's a very different way to organise yourself as a speciality town. So you have got something unique and special, and that's intertwined with your tourist offer. But what's interesting about the speciality towns compared to the comparison shopping towns is the speciality towns really do understand the culture, the heritage, and local people and residents. One minute. I won't show you these. The last one's the convenience and community location. We found a lot of these have got flatter lines. And these are just smaller, smaller, um, often smaller centres, but not always. There was an awful lot of uh, towns in our sample that would have thought they were comparison shopping towns that had more of this uh, profile. So I think, you know, if you think about those signatures, what, what they're doing is that they're, they're those signatures sort of communi communicating to us through the way people use the town with their activity, their footfall, what type of offer that location has, has got. And one of the problems we find dealing with the retail sector and the retail property sector is that they're not attuned enough to the individual locations. So they're not adapting their offer to meet the overall offer of what that, that town, the real function uh, that that uh, town or location is really playing in people's minds. So that would be my world, world of warning to you. You know, make sure that your public realm strategy is integrated uh, and not just at the overall Dublin City Council, you know, that, at, at the, the, the spatial level of the city, but also as you were talking about the different zones and quarters, the tourism area and so on, Really understand activity levels in those smaller locations and make sure the public realm is acting as a collaborator to, to glue that channel of all the operators together in those smaller locations. Uh, and if you want some help with that, you can join our next project. We've got uh, footfall data coming in now from lots of different locations. Uh, and we've employed the help of mathematicians and computer scientists so that we really can 
uh, get advanced in our sort of modeling techniques and tell you immediately uh, in much more sort of real time what interventions have an effect and which ones maybe aren't uh, making the difference that you would like. So thank you very much. Thank you.